Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Episode 267, Multidimensional Evolution, Exploring Consciousness with Kim McCall. And joining us from the other side of the world, so far on the other side of the world, I did not realize it was past the international dateline and I screwed up our first podcast recording appointment. But joining us today is anthropologist and consciousness researcher, Kim McCall, all the way from Central Australia. How you, or should I say good day, Kim? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can say good day. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Lovely to be Fantastic. here. Fantastic. Right. You know, I've been plowing my way uh, through your book, Multidimensional Evolution, for the past week, and I've been enjoying it. It's, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a very personally, you know, called personal explorations of consciousness. And I like the fact that you go into you know, your experiences, and it kind of shows you how you got to this point um, and through, you know, how you lived. And I think this is, a, why don't you give us uh, a little bit of the Kim McCall bio, uh, so people, before we get into the meat of the conversation, can get familiar with you and why you're into this. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I wrote the book really as a kind of book that I would have liked to have had when things first started going a bit weird for me because I wasn't into, I wasn't into consciousness or, you know, I wasn't really into any kind of spirituality or anything like that for, you know, well into my twenties. And then I, I needed, I needed some self care. So I wasn't in a very good place in my, in my early twenties. So I'd is anybody in a really good place in their well, early twenties? So, like I, th I think about me, like I was touring around with my band, and when I'm trying to think about my life, like I was about as far away from uh, a enlightened consciousness as you could get. I mean, most of my consciousness was spent on the floor after a you know a yes. twelve pack. Yes, yes, exactly. I spend a lot of time on floors, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and look, I mean, I meet young people who I just look at and I'm in awe of, you know, because they just seem to be so clear on what they're doing here. But I definitely wasn't one of those. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think you know the majority is in that position. We we just kind of groping our way around life, you know, trying to make the the most the best of mm -hmm. things. But for me, what it led to a friend of mine at university had come back from this meditation center in Indonesia and, and was, was raving about, you know, how profound it was. And so the next uh, summer break, I went to Indonesia and I spent some time meditating. And I really, I just assumed when you meditate, you sort of calm, you, maybe you calm down, you know, find some inner peace. Right. Um, but it, instead, it just started, it opened up things that I had no reference point I want to get to that in one second, but yes. let's start with where were you living at the time? Were you in Australia? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, uh, in terms of that background, I was studying in the in the UK, in England. Um, I'm actually originally from Germany. Okay. Th that's where I did my growing up. Uh, bit you of, don't sound like you're from Germany, Kim. No, I, I know. I know. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately. I used to, um, but uh, but you know maybe by my name you can tell it's not exactly German. I've got a German Irish background, but uh, sure. But German was my, my first language growing up, and oh uh, fantastic! I ended up in the UK studying, and yeah, that's that's where I was. So making a trip to Indonesia to study meditation that seems to me like a big step. So when I you think of the distance between Indonesia and the United Kingdom at the time, I mean, somebody just comes back like, hey, man, I went to Indonesia and did some meditation and it was really badass. You should go too. That that to me, um, like how long were you going to go for? A couple of weeks or something like that just to check it out? Um, well, I, I was, I think we had about two months of a break um, during term, summer break. And that's pretty much the time I wanted to to take. Uh, you know, when you say it like that now, it's pretty crazy because I'm sure there's meditation centers just somewhere in the next town over in England, right? Yeah, it's the UK. <laughs> you got to call up, you know, like where, where did Paul McCartney go or whatever? Yeah. Or any, you know, any of those guys. Where did Alistair Crowley hang out? But the idea that like 
in, that just seems like a real gutsy move to me. And so when you're saying like, oh yeah, well, I just you know I went out to Indonesia for the summer. I'm like, holy crap! Did you have to bring? You're like that sounds to me like is it is it a place full of unrest? I mean, just as the regular ugly American here, um, that just why it seems so gutsy uh, to be like, I'm gonna go check out this thing. So w- were you like, were you into meditation? Were you into New Age stuff? No, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was just being introduced, you know, through that friend, and there was another friend in England who started talking about. Things like auras and crystals and spirits and past lives, but it not, none of it really meant anything to me. Um, and that wasn't even the appeal. That wasn't what drew me to Indonesia. It's funny. I actually had never thought about it like that, you know? Like it just, it was just the step. And I guess my life has been a bit like that. There's always been these, these steps that just offered themselves. And somehow I knew or felt compelled, I should say. To take it, you know, there was like this this inner voice that went, yeah, just got to do this. Um, and I did have a lot of soul searching. I I was uh, I had just not long into a relationship with this girl I was very much in love with, and leaving her for that time seemed pretty crazy too. So I do remember sort of the couple of days before I actually got on my plane, just going, "What am I doing? You know, am I crazy here?" But it just, yeah, just had that real compulsion, I'd say. So something pulled you there, mm. and when you get there, you said, you know, I think about meditation, and I, I, have, a, I have a practice, or I try, you know, I don't think, um, I, like we were talking about Wim Hof earlier before we started recording, and that, mm. you know, he has such, you know, he can concentrate to such an extent and, you know, control his bodily functions in a way that are fantastic. And when I think about meditation, it's like a nice way to quiet my mind and everything, but mm. meditation opened up something deeper for you. Yes, yeah, that's right. So I was looking for the quiet mind, but instead I I found, you know, if I'd gone to any psychiatrist or something, would have probably been described as, I don't know, the labels, you know, neurosis, psychosis, um, because I started perceiving things I hadn't perceived before and okay. um, seeing things that didn't seem to be there or didn't really make sense and, and, and feeling things and hearing things. Well, give me, give me an example of something you saw where like, cause you seem, you're probably, a, you're a college student, level headed guy thinking, oh, meditation's a good idea. I know it's helped a lot of people. I'm looking for some centering in my life or, yeah, and trying new things. I'm in my twenties. And then, uh, you see what that's like, oh man, what did I, <laughs> what am I looking at here? Well, I mean, the, one of the things I talk about in my book was getting into this space where I was um, walking through Solo, was the, the city in, in, in Java, in Indonesia, uh, walking through Solo and see there was, there was physically, there was these plastic bags waving across the road. But I literally stopped in my tracks and felt um, a lot of fear to move on because I, I perceived there were these these fearful beings that were kind of moving around and uh you know and i was standing there going this doesn't make any sense but i was really really afraid you know um so that's quite crazy in a way i would be lying down in the meditation hall with my eyes closed and i could see people walking around the room um around at, at an angle that I, you know didn't make sense for me to be able to see so this is actual people there was actual people in the room not not just you know, sure. spirits or anything um but i could see them with my eyes closed not open my eyes and yes they were walking along there um yeah those things which i now understand but at the time i had no reference point for well i want to get into that because it, first of all i mean meditation a lot of times people talk about not just the centering and the, and the stillness but meditation on a, a deeper level you know, you talk about the third eye and, you know, you said you, you're perceiving things mm. that in your previous life, as in like you're just your regular going to college dude life, um, you didn't perceive them. So was there a particular point when you realized that this wasn't, you know, just imagination or whatever, you were like seeing things on a different plane, a different dimension, as it were? Um. I think that really took me to to feel really confident in that. You know, that took me quite a long time. There was a long time this doubting, 
you know, I'm, 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 I'm imagining, I'm, I don't know, you know, I didn't, there was this, this, this distrust, I suppose, of those sort of perceptions for quite a long time. So I can't give you a, a eureka moment or anything. Like yeah, that. no, not for that. I mean, I, I guess, you know, there were certain things that happened, like the, the meditation teacher who was a, an older Indonesian man, um, I guess the way he treated things, you know, he was very matter of fact. So, for example, when you talk about the third eye, one thing that, that started uh, there and it's been continued really throughout my life since then was feeling pulsation and pressure around the area of the third eye. And okay. when I mentioned that to him, the, the, um, that, that's the thing. I do remember that there was a particular session where that started and at the, during the meditation. Then after the meditation, we always had a chance to ask questions and, and share our experiences. And I said, well, I had this, I had this, I'm feeling these sensations there. And he just said, yeah, that makes sense. We, we made some changes to the, you know, to the meditation space somehow. They'd, they'd, uh, I don't know, they'd, uh, him and some other local people had done some kind of Buddhist type ceremony um, at one of the altars in the space. For him, so for him, there was this logical, just the way he responded it was very matter of fact. So those things that did help to just go, okay, so this is obviously like, so you were doing something. So when you were in the meditation, something had happened to you that to him made perfect sense because they had changed the space in a certain way, or they had yes. done something with the place and then it invited different things in, or it made for uh, an experience a non-physical experience, as it were, that would change you. So that's that's an interesting thing right there because that's his little bit of confirmation like, oh, all right, well, we added this carpet and this carpet's supposed to make you see... (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. uh, See white birds and now you saw more white birds. So there you go. So that's an interesting thing just on its own that you would have this experience based on something you didn't even know about. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, And that there is such a causality in that in that dimension of life, you know, you do something over here and then these curious energetic sensations start happening over there. You know, what I think is interesting about that is that, you know, did you come from, what did you study in college? You know, were you the kind of person that was all, like you said, um, you weren't necessarily a very spiritual person. And in the book you talk about, you're experiencing this, you know, existential malaise that where you're like, oh, I think, you know, is this it? Everybody has that moment in their 20s yeah. where they just kind of look at the world. They, You think that, because earlier on, you think that the people in charge know what they're doing. And so all of a sudden when you realize that the inmates are running the asylum <laughs> and, you know, that nobody knows what's going on, you kind of just look up at around you and you're just like, is this it? Yeah. Um, and so you're at that point when you go to this place and were you surprised almost, or was that just, was it the kind of meditation place where other people were having those same kind of experiences? Well, uh, so just to go back, you, you asked me what I was studying at college. That was anthropology. Okay. Okay. Time. So um, you were already but, open to this. I, you know, you were already open to a lot of the ideas. Well, I guess anthropology. I guess so. I mean, I, I had read Carlos Castaneda at that stage. That was actually before I got to university. So, so I suppose that would have sown some seeds, although I don't remember it being much in the forefront of my my mind. But sure, sure anthropology. We touch on we touch on all kinds of um, beliefs and experiences that people talk about. I just feel like the anthropologists I've met are always open to interesting things um, like this. Whereas when you meet like a geneticist or whatever, he's like, eh, ghosts, it's all crap. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's, so it's interesting, you know, like what you're studying, the things that you are open to kind of, you know, that, that sets you on the path to then be able to start experiencing the world in maybe a non-material or a non-reductivist way. Yeah, look, it can help, you know. I, I think, like, anthropology is, on the whole, is quite materialistic. Uh, and, and I think people are a bit concerned about wanting to be seen as a proper science, so they try and sure. stay away from taking on um, the beliefs of the people they're working with too much, on the whole. So I had a bit of a struggle with that, actually, especially as I went on through university and I was opening up into that. And then I was reading anthropology and I was going, that's what I'm experiencing what they're talking about, you know, and trying to trying to put that into essays didn't always go down very well. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, You're not supposed to be the subject. Yes. Cam. Yes, exactly. You know, so we're going through these initial experiences are happening to you. You're going through it. Were other people at the center having the same kind of thing? Um, yes. Yeah, there were. There was certainly, I think we were all having profound experiences at that center in different ways. Um, you know, I remember one guy who'd been, he'd been there for a long time. He was there for about a year and I don't, he never really shared what was going on for him, but. He's like a dude that um, just didn't need a job or what? <laughs> I mean, I just think, how do you get to go? Like, I'd like to go to a meditation center for a year. Yeah, he must have been good at saving up or something. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, but uh, I just remember I just remember him going through some really intense, emotional, painful things. You know, he didn't share a lot, but it was very obvious um, sure. for us. Other people, one, there's this one guy who every time the meditation ended, he'd, he'd have these amazing visions to share, which that wasn't at all what was happening for me, you know. So that I couldn't really relate to that. Um, so it's kind of like everybody had their very personal experiences, I think. But yeah, there was definitely there was definitely a, a, an opening and a sensitivity to the fact that there was more to, you know, more to life than we most of us had I think thought before we got there. And so this kind of sets you on your path then. So like, you know, you go to the center, you start feeling a you know something bigger than yourself or something bigger than just the, ma- the material world. Um, when is when is the next time you can explore this? You know, like so you go back to college uh, and you're you know your regular life and you got to take your tests and do homework and you know you can't just uh, <laughs> live in the metaphysical plane all the time. Mm. Um, when is the next time you get you you can keep furthering this kind of study of yourself? Well. In some ways, the college life was actually very conducive because it did give me plenty of time. Um, I was lucky I didn't need to work uh, on the side of get, being at university. So I was essentially going to my lectures, you know, doing my readings and whatever, you know, to the extent that I did, and and meditating a lot. So I spent, after I came back from Indonesia, I spent, I'd say, at least one, maybe two or three hours a day uh, meditating first thing in the morning, later in the day. And it was became it became almost necessary because one of the things that happened with this opening is that I became so sensitive that I really struggled. Um, and again, I didn't actually really understand what was happening, but I would come home from being out, being at college or whatever, and just feel really overwhelmed. Well, you, you talk about that a little bit in the book when you say mm. that um, eventually you discuss intruders and helpers. Mm. So when you had that first experience, you see things and they're these fearful entities in, you know, manipulating these plastic bags or whatever, or represented by them. Mm. And then you become sensitive to other things that are coexisting alongside us. And so as you're meditating, you're feeling these things, you're in there for, you know, two or three hours a day, which is, that's a, that's a long time mm. to get in there. I mean, that's like training for a marathon, but, but in your head. Um, so as you're doing that, and in the book, you talk about these intruders and helpers. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's really, um, uh, you know, certainly jumping ahead in the sense of me having those ideas, those concepts, right? That came, that came later um, when I went and studied elsewhere. We'll probably get to that in a bit. But the concept, the idea is that really there is two types of energy, if you want, in the world that we create as people. One is, you know, one is positive and supporting and, and helpful and uplifting, and the other one is uh, more, in, so, in some way, more um, disturbed or, 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 or sort of, you know, heavier or pulling down. And in some cases, really malicious, right? So there's a whole spectrum. I mean, the term intruder kind of covers. It's, the term intruder sounds quite menacing. Uh, menacing, a little bit. yeah. Exactly. Intruder sounds-, sounds like you're breaking into my house and going to take my stuff. Exactly. And so that uh, I think that term is, in in a way, I, I, I like to sort of reserve that for people who are really deliberately, um, you know, trying to get out, take other take other people down or, or, or manipulate them. And you you have people like that in physical life. Um, but we also, what I came to understand is that we also have, with obviously then continue after this physical life, and then we have people in, in non-physical life that that also do that, that can um, impact people. But but really, you know, what I think what I was struggling with a lot at that stage was simply the energies of 
you know, most of us don't carry like the most uplifting energy all the time. You know, we all struggle with things and we struggle with feeling, feeling down or, or, or you know, people, people. Well, when self- you meet somebody who's, when you meet somebody who's happy all the time, you got to think like either they're faking it, they're crazy or they're on drugs. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's that might be the case, or you know, or maybe they hit the sweet spot somehow. <laughs> right, of course, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're twenty five lives ahead of me, and they've got it all yeah, figured exactly. out. Exactly, but but um, but I guess you know uh, this the the and people who are there's this category of I guess empath, right? People that are just naturally open to other people's energies, um can just struggle just being around other people because, sure. uh, and that seemed to be what was happening to me there. So I was just going around people and then I came home and I felt like I was carrying all these kind of thoughts and feelings that weren't mine, you know, that weren't really, that I didn't have before. And then once I started meditating and so on, it would all fade away again. When you were meditating then, you know, the real popular thing now is just to focus on the breath and almost try to think about nothing. Mm. Um, were, but also other people meditate where they try to think about something, you know, when you were meditating, was it the idea of emptying your mind or was it concentrating on something to try and manifest or something like that? Well, it was, it was concentrating on the body. So it was essentially this, this, I guess the idea in a lot of meditation techniques, whether you focus on the breath or on the body is you're trying to give your body a point of reference that becomes the sort of the center point. And so in this case, you'd go through, we, I would go through my, from my feet, my calves, my thighs, you know, up all the way to the top of my head and just stay on, on each part for however long it felt right at the time. Um, and just kind of constantly going and you know, feeling the relaxation of that part of my body. And, you know, I didn't really, uh, again, understand at the time, it just seemed like a f- way of focusing you know, focusing the mind in a way. But, you know, since then, I've come to understand a lot more how we carry, you know, what we carry in the body, like how we carry our own experiences, like uh, things that we don't remember, you know, childhood traumas and childhood experiences, and even our ancestral experiences through the genetics, you know, all of that is, is in the body. And how by giving it so much focus and intention, it can actually allow us to, to get in touch with and release some of those things. So, Well, I like what you're saying there because I always think it's, it's fascinating that so much of our physical processes are completely uh, subconscious. Mm. You know, we, we don't even think about them. I mean, that's the point. We, you know, you, you don't think about breathing. It happens. You don't think about your feet touching the ground and how each toe feels on it and stuff because we only focus on you know what we think is important at the time and and our consciousness allows us to do that but at the same time there are all these processes going on where uh, you know you're like I'm sitting in a chair right now I'm cross-legged sitting in a chair and I have you know 20 different points of touch yes where I'm touching this chair but at the same time I'm not thinking about it because I'm talking to you and when you meditate, sometimes you can focus on those points and realize how much you know physical input we're getting, and it helps you just you know real uh, you know think about that that kind of thing. That it, here's where I am. I'm not just in my head off somewhere, but this is where I, I physically am. And so when you talk about that way of looking at each part of your body and thinking about it because when you think about your neck like all of a sudden you feel your Mm, neck mm. like oh hey how did that happen yeah and doing that to help you return to yourself after you're sensitive to everybody else's energies getting in your way yes yeah absolutely and the other thing i liked about this particular meditation technique was that um essentially it, it the way it was talked about in the in the meditation center was your intro introverted meditation which was the one where you sit down and so on. And then the rest of your day, um, the teacher always called your daily meditation, which essentially was a, a reminder to the fact that, uh, you know, you can bring yourself to that space in one way or another at any time. So as you are like right now, as we're sitting here talking, we can actually bring our awareness to our bodies 
and talk at the same time and then notice that even this process here, right, you just bring awareness to it, it becomes a meditation in itself. Right, it's the focus and it's the, you know, realizing what we're doing is, you know, that that being able to concentrate our minds on something seems to be that's something that meditation can help with. Well, especially me, because I am completely ADD. Mm. The men not diagnosed or whatever. I'm not taking Ritalin. Well, I've, I've snorted Ritalin before, but that was before a test. <laughs> um, but no, but the idea that, uh, you know, in, in our heads, like sometimes it's so easy to be talking to somebody and we're thinking about something else and we're not here in the present moment. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's the, that's the key, isn't it? Being in the present moment. And in enjoying what we have right now and not worried about the future and not uh, anxious about the past and what's happened to us. And we talk about the multiple dimensions and, you know, uh, multidimensional evolution. Mm. Um, you know, there's some terms in your book that I think uh, I thought were super interesting. I'd love to go over them. And I also think they relate in, in an anthropological uh, in an anthropological sense to, you know, things that people have believed for, you know, Oh, probably 10,000 years. And that's, you know, with the psychosoma, the mental soma, and I do not know how to pronounce the energosoma. Oh, energo, energosoma. An energosoma. All right, yeah. I got close. So I kind of want to get into the, those ideas because that's where I think we have this idea of the multidimensional person. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one of the, so those terms that you describe there come from a Brazilian framework um, called Conscienciology, which is the study of consciousness. And I got into that because I started having out-of-body experiences through the meditation. So I would quite often go to, when I went to sleep, I would do the meditation as I went to sleep, you know, going through my body and, and just keeping awareness on my body. So it was no longer just seeing other people in the room, that in the room with you, it was taken off. Yes, and talking to people outside of my body and being in places that, well, having experienced, so for a long time I had this label dreams, <clears throat> but it just didn't seem to do it justice because there was these real tan this real tang tangibility about it, you know, and I'd come, I'd wake up feeling different energies there. And so it felt like another part of my life. And I didn't, but so this is where, I, this is where the idea of writing my book came in. I didn't have a reference point. I wasn't. Sure. I, I didn't know about Robert Monroe. I mean, there are other reference points. You know, there's a lot of literature about OBEs, but I didn't know anything about it. So, and then I guess I had a similar moment to to you know, like you pointed out, going all the way to Indonesia. I I came across while I was in the UK in my last year of university and kind of thinking, what am I going to do afterwards? I came across a interview with this Brazilian consciousness researcher, Valdo Vieira, and he talked about all these in the interview he talked about all these kinds of experiences that I just could relate to so much and I just went that's where I'm going I've got to study with this man <laughs> and so after I finished university I ended up going to Brazil and that's where I learned about these these concepts so uh, this discipline of conscienciology had been developed specifically by by Valdo to move away from dealing with with these kind of things in a religious framework and trying to approach them in a new, so the, the created terms to create new terms. So we don't deal with like astral body and soul and those kinds of things. Right. So you're not just throwing out the soul or um, the psyche or, and then plus anything when you talk about like the, the mind or whatever, then you start dealing with Freudian topics. So, I mean um, you have psychology from the, medical perspective yeah. and you have religion from the spiritual perspective and those things come with a certain kind of baggage anything that comes with religion is going to come with rules and that's not harsh on religion or whatever because there's, it, it has done some great things for humanity but at the same time like it's going to come with rules and preconceived notions yes. where somebody has an out-of-body experience all of a sudden they're wondering oh was that you know was that the devil trying to tempt me with something and you want to kind of get that out of there so that you can deal with the experience as it was without the baggage coming with it. Yes, exactly. So what's the psychosoma? Yeah, so the soma is body in Greek. Soma is the word for body in, in Greek. So in conscienciology, there's the, this sort of four-tiered system that, of bodies that we all have as consciousnesses. Um, the soma is the physical body. And then the psychosoma is the emotional body. 
or what in other people might call the astral body. That is the body that leaves our physical body when we sleep and have an out-of-body experience. Um, and it, it looks, for the most part, for most people, it's like a replica of their physical body um, because it seems to be shaped by our self-image. So uh, interestingly enough, you know, often as we get older, the psychosoma doesn't age in the same way because we kind of have this, we seem to have an image of ourselves that, you know, is at a stage that we are quite fond of ourselves. <laughs> sure. So we might be in our early 30s or something. Um, so I remember, and it's interesting, and I, I was thinking about that last night, actually. I, I remember I had one of my anthropology lecturers, actually, in the religion lecturer. He was, he was definitely, we never talked about it, but just the way he was, he, he knew, you know, he, I think he could see, I think he was a psychic. And I actually had a couple of OBs with him. Um, and, but he was, he was, he had a full head of hair. He was, he was bald and he was like in his sixties and he had a full head of hair and, and he was, you know, in his thirties in, in those OBEs. Uh, and I didn't. Right. I, he was buff and like, Hey professor, you've been yeah. working out. <laughs> um, I still looked like an academic, not so buff, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he, um, but this was before I, you know, had studied this stuff. And then I, and then I learned, for example, in Brazil about this process that we, often keep ourselves, generally keep ourselves looking younger. Um, so yeah, so the psychosoma is essentially a replica of the physical body. We leave the physical body with it and, and the experiences we have in other dimensions, whether it is meeting, you know, meeting deceased friends, love, loved ones, um, or, you know, the kind, or there's such a wide range of experiences people have out of the body. They happen generally in the psychosoma. So is it, and so when you say emotional body, is it, I mean, different, a kind of consciousness? Like we find that when you're in your psychosomatic body and out-of-body experience, are you a more emotional person? Are you quicker to anger? Are you quicker to cry? Like we've all had the dreams thing where we've had uncontrollable crying in yes, our dreams. Yeah. And that seems to me like whatever's going on in my brain or whatever, or whatever, you know, particular neurons getting activated that night is the sad neuron. Mm. And so, like, mm. is there something with um, our emotional bodies that we may act differently than we would in regular life? Or, phys yes. you know, our, our physicality, yeah. our regular soma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. So just to get clear on the sort of the framework, when I talk about, so with consciousness, the way I understand consciousness is that consciousness is, is in a sense separate from all of these bodies and it uses you know it's like the the ghost in the machine or it's like the driver it uses the different bodies it uses right now we are sitting here in our physical bodies and you know we are experiencing a certain form of awareness of course which is very much determined by our physical body and that is consciousness manifesting itself here through this body and then if we leave it in the psychosoma that's just another body used by consciousness, and so is the mental soma. And each of these bodies gives, gives us different kinds of experiences. So the physical body gives us particularly restrictive kind of experience, um, you know, one with, in, that involves a lot of you know, physical pain and eventually death, and, and our senses are very limited. Um, in the psychosoma, we have a more expansive state. But yes, it's called the emotional body because... It does. It is a stage where our emotions are heightened, and we create like we're driven by our desires often. So you can have, you know, especially in the beginning, before you have control, you can have a desire, and you. It's a very creative space. This this non physical dimension. So you think of something, and it'll appear in your mind's eye, but it'll seem real to you. Um, so we can create things and we can fulfill our desires quickly and it becomes it's a very murky space because there's this this whole combination of living in a in a fantasy world in the non-physical dimension and right. also interacting with the real world I, I, I was thinking about this the other day do you know the dreams may come movie oh yeah based on the Richard Williams? Matheson novel yeah yeah and so you know when he first when when the character played by Robin Williams first has died and he's wakes up in this new dimension everything there is actually just created around his mind it's all just familiar you know scenes and paintings from his his wife's 
and then there's this dramatic scene where his his helper kind of tears uh, tears it open, and then he steps into a world where there's actually other people. Don't don't know if you remember that, but that's for me. That's the the um, you know that's a really nice depiction of how that extra physical world works. That we okay spend uh, potentially can spend a lot of time um, just operating from our desires and our emotions and just in a sense interacting with our own creations um, until we kind of get that jump in awareness and then it's like the curtain opens and you can actually see people around you and- well you know one question i have about the different bodies and it, it it's probably it comes from when you were you said um that our consciousness is using these particular bodies so our consciousness is in the physical body um where you break your leg and it hurts or whatever. You're, you're conscious in the emotional body where you feel things very intensely and you're conscious in the mental body where we probably analyze stuff and, and you know, the mental soma. Yes. Um, yeah, where, great where clarity. And, yeah. So then when we, when we go back to our consciousness itself, is that anything in particular? Like how are consciousness, conscious, <laughs> it's hard to say consciousness is <laughs> plural, um, but what is the difference then between your consciousness and my consciousness? Because it sounds like the physical body and the mental body and the emotional body then are going to, that's going to create how we treat each other or what we do or, you know, it's, it's the circumstances of the body it's using. Mm. And then what is then the fundamental difference between my consciousness and your consciousness? Yeah, I mean, that is a big question because, and I don't really know the answer to that. I, well, right. I mean, I, that's, the, that's the kind of question after somebody like tokes a big bowl or whatever, yeah. like, dude, <laughs> then what's you the difference know the between our, <laughs> our consciousness is man? I, I mean, I guess, look, so, so where I'm at with that at the moment is that we're all come from some same source. And at the same time, this is very paradoxical. That's how I think, you know. And that is, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes when you start getting to this stuff, you don't need to toke on bowls anymore. Like you just get these experiences <laughs> where you go far out. Is that <laughs> can this be real? <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. So that on the one hand, we're all essentially from the same source, but at the same time, we've become individuated, and so we're all individual you know individuated units of something that we don't actually understand yet really what it is and we are going through these you know vast chains of experiences across lifetimes much vaster than we think i think often we think about lifetimes oh well i probably was you know i was a servant here and a king there and maybe i was this but we have had I think we've had thousands of lives here and other planets and in other, you know, other kinds of beings. And, and that's what makes us, you know, that's what makes you, you and me, me and everybody listening, you know, individual. And you call that the existential seriality? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the series of existences that we've had. Um, and so, you know, it's this, it's this, it's this paradox, I think, that we are really all the same. We're really all, uh, uh, you know, expressions of what I call, uh, you know, the ultimate being. And at the same time, we are infinitely individuated. Through thousands of lives yes. and through our different, and also within those thousands of lives, we have the different, uh, the bodies of each life. Yep. And, you know, I think that's interesting there because that's also very, um, a very old concept yes. in, in that idea of the multiple bodies because I, I remember talking to Jan Van Eiselstein uh, about her book, The Spirits from the Edge of the World, where she was trying to preserve as much of, you know, Siberian shamanism mm. as she could. And, and it, you know, it was like the, like one of the longest civilizations, um, like uninterrupted civilizations in the world mm. where they had been, you know, they had been living there for like 7,500 years. And the shamans there would often talk about it. Well, we got, of course, we have several different bodies. We have the, you know, the bodies that we fly with the spirits, yes. and then the bodies we have where we're eating, you know, going fishing and things like that. And you know, that idea is just a very, very ancient thought 
Um, so, you know, we think about the New Age movement, well, we call it the New Age. Yes. Um, but it seems to be the, you know, basically the old age movement, really. <laughs> Absolutely. And look, I, I, if I can, you know, up the up the date ante there, because cause I work with Aboriginal Australia. and Oh, sure. That's often described as the oldest living culture on earth, too. And um, uh, they, because I, I think what makes Aboriginal Australia so, as an interesting um, environment is that, it, you know, there was largely no connection for with other cultures for a good 50,000 years. And so, um, and they keep finding, you know, they keep raising the date further and further as they do more archaeological work. And so we know that basically what people say here has been here for that long time, you know, 50,000 years. And yeah, people talk a lot about astral travel, you know, extra, like, uh, not out of body experiences, and <clears throat> one thing I found really interesting. You might have heard of that concept of the silver cord, and that people talk about in the OB literature. That there is this cord that right. Can, there's something connects, that connects you back. It connects the psychosoma back to the physical body to to you know it's like a flow of energy. But Aboriginal people talk about that, and so that for me is, is gives it a really good. It has strong evidentiary value because that you know it wasn't an idea. Either it's a very resilient idea that <laughs> came here 100,000 years ago or something has persisted, or it's actually something people are really experiencing here as well as in the Monroe Institute and in Siberia and in Africa. And so have you had that? Have you seen the cord or whatever in your own particular out-of-body experiences? I have not seen my own cord. Um, I have seen, uh, I've, sometimes I run workshops for people, out-of-body workshops, and in those, I've seen other people's chords with a, you know, sort of, I guess, we'd say clairvoyant. I don't know. It just seems to happen sometimes. Well, you know, what do you think is the, uh, you know, we talk about the multiple bodies and the multiple lives. Because if, if consciousness is like this force in the universe you know, or, uh, you know, this source of energy, and then it finds its way into different kinds of experiences from the spiritual from you know to the physical and then it just keeps on recurring and you know what do you think then might be the best way to get closer to your own particular consciousness or to you know to to feel closer to the source rather than feel more separated from the rest Ooh. of the world yeah that's i like the way you phrase that cuz feeling closer to the source I think really also helps us feel closer to everybody around us, you know, to feel connected to life because as you say, like it's, it's everywhere. Um, look, I think, I think the processes for that, you know, have been explored in so many different, in so many different spiritual traditions. And it, it essentially seems to come back to what we talked about in the beginning, you know, making ourselves present, being in the moment and uh, slowing ourselves down. Connecting with nature, I find, really helps. So when we talk about energy, and I talked about before about being, being influenced by all this, everybody else's energy, when you go to nature, energy is, is much more peaceful and, and nourishing and expansive. So just taking some time you know, every day, just spending a bit of time connecting with whatever you've got, you know, whether it's a pot plant or a tree in your garden, or if you're <laughs> lucky enough to go to the beach, you know, that's, that's a great place. Um, and really stop and really connect with your own, your own body and your own energies. I mean, I really always encourage people to connect, to, to, to get familiar with their own energies and um, ideally do some regular energy work. Do you see consciousness expressed in non-human life yes for sure you mean like animals and like other animals rather and plants? animals or even trees and, or you know anything yes. like that you, you, you maybe think about nature is this idea that consciousness like we all have our bits of it or whatever that have evolved in our bodies yeah. through through lifetimes and through uh the lived experience that we have in this body and this head mm. um but do we see elements of consciousness in nature or even in things that are not natural, man-made things? Mm. Um, so definitely in nature. 
Um, one of my favorite uh, workshops to do is is an out of is an outdoor energy workshop where we spend time you know moving energies and then connecting with at one stage you connect with different trees and plants around you and you i mean the trees have different personalities you know <laughs> um sure. they 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 yeah they feel different they send you you get different information from them and the same with with plants so so all kinds of plants yes and you know insects everything down to the virus i think is 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 consciousness manifesting itself you know bacteria um man-made things i don't think they have consciousness but they have they they might re reflect the energy of the creators you know the the i mean anything that's made started off in people's minds and people's thoughts and then it, people invested energy in making it and so in that sense they carry they might you know th like buildings or or cars or you know anything really carries a certain energy but it's not consciousness um however you know, consciousness can, so sometimes, so electronics, I was just looking at my computer, I was thinking about all these objects, and that's, right. ele electronics are a space that non-physical consciousness seems to be able to, you know, interfere with sometimes and, and kind of let us know it's there or, so sometimes we think the computer has a consciousness, but <laughs> I think that's uh, actually someone else. Right, so like a you know some other consciousness playing with it. Well, that's the idea too of the you know the electronic voice phenomenon that yes. we have in you know the paranormal investigation world, um, or you know uh, when people use their spirit boxes and they think that you know uh, they hear you know someone say words to them, uh, affecting the words by being able to manipulate something in the electronics and mm. make it say the message that you want to say to the people. Um, there's, you know, just one more concept I think I want to explore from the book that I think is, is a good one, um, for a lot of people who, you know, for any of us who have this idea of, well, it's a spiritual universe or there's more to it than we know, um, I think is your, you know, your evolutionary superiority syndrome. Oh, yes. And, you know, you can talk about that in the book and do you want to explain that and maybe give a tip on how we can try to avoid that? <laughs> um well so what happened because for whatever reason you know i started meditating and i very quickly started getting these kind of transcendental experiences and um all these you know out of body states and all that stuff uh one thing that kicked in for me was this personality trait that was you know, not a very nice personality trait is that i um, had this sense of superiority, you know, something special. And, you know, I understand, I understand now, um, the source of that in, in, in the past lives of, uh, kind of, you know, religious hierarchies and, 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 you know, assuming this, this mantle of being a superior as a lot of religions have that, right. Um, the, right. the untouchable, you know, people like the Pope and other other uh, high places, so you, you you can't be critical and so on. Um, so somehow I carried something like that, uh, it seems, and and I know, you know, I've, I've, I guess I've seen it in in others as well. I think it it it's in some ways perhaps a factor of something something opening up that seems to make you so different from most other people around you. You know, people who don't think about this, and you somehow think, well. I must be special, you know. <laughs> right. And or and you or you guys aren't just paying attention. So yeah. you're idiots. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, exactly. I've got the direct line to God and uh I'm gonna go uh talk to him with my third eye. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um yeah, so look, I think it's a real trap. It certainly it certainly was um for me and I still like to remind myself of um just how important it is just to be a guy you know i was really so what really helped me was have a family have kids they get you take you down to down down a peg or two very quickly right so yeah i think i think the, the yeah and the important thing really when i look at it now is it was also you know i don't know if you know the idea of spiritual bypassing you probably come across that like it was it was i was essentially bypassing a lot of pain by 
by um, going, oh, well, I'm up here now. I'm up here. I don't actually have to deal with these, these, you know, my messed up relationship with my parents or whatever, you know, human stuff because I'm, I'm, I've discovered this other world. And so I guess going, you know, honoring our humanity, like realizing that we all have parents and we all have childhood stuff and we all got stuff we got to do here just as a normal human being, as well as ideally, you know, embracing our, our multidimensional nature. Um, I think that'll, I think that can help us, uh, yeah, sort of stay, stay grounded, stay, a stay bit. grounded. Well, exactly. It, it, it really is hard, you know, you know, namaste, the idea that there is something in you that I also have in me. It really is hard to remember that sometimes when you want to strangle somebody <laughs> that, you know, no matter how much you want to just murder that person, yeah, you also have to understand that there is a piece of them that is exactly like you. And it's a reason to have some compassion, no matter what they've done. Uh, and that's probably trying to look at that little piece of consciousness um, that we all come from the same source and try to remember that next time you want to pull somebody's hair out for doing something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so that, you know, I really does, you know, when I thought about that, the, uh, this, the spiritual superiority sy- syndrome, it really is something. It's easy to look at like, look at those apes. They're not, they're not thinking about the same things that we are, or they're just thinking about football or, you know, something stupid when you, you know, when you're trying to look at, you know, how are people more alike than they're different? Yeah. Um, and that's, and you find yourself trying to understand or be at least empathetic. And it doesn't seem probably unless you're fighting in a war or something like that, it, it never seems to be wrong or at least to lead to bad things. If you err on the side of empathy. Absolutely. I don't think you can ever err on the side of empathy. Uh, so, you know, I just, I, I liked that concept and how you talked about it and, you know, I would love to go off and talk. We're going to have to bring you back and talk about like OBE tips and things like that. But we kind of want to just, I wanted to get you in and have a discussion for the first time to talk about your philosophy of this multidimensional evolution. And if there's one thing, like, so let's say, um, you know, you want to get somebody, first of all, you guys can get a, a link directly to the book if you guys want to buy it, othersidepodcast.com slash 267. You'll be able to find a link uh, to pick up Kim McCall's book in the show notes. Uh, but at the same time, if there's one message that you think could kind of sum up the book or get that book, you know, that idea that like, if you read my book, do not miss this thing. What's that <laughs> message? Um, well, the thing that I like to to emphasize and what I think opens up to us when we realize that we are multidimensional beings is that we can really take Every moment is, becomes an opportunity. Every moment becomes an opportunity to connect more deeply with ourselves, more deeply with whoever is in front of us, around us, and to make some kind of contribution to life around us just by the energies that we're putting out. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, Cam. I appreciate you waking up early on the far side of the world to join us here to talk about your multidimensional evolution book. I want to wish you luck on your journey. I mean, from... Uh, Germany to the UK to Indonesia to Rio de Janeiro uh, to Central Australia. Your spiritual and academic journey has taken you all over the planet. And I just hope that it keeps you going on that same kind of adventure because it seems like it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. And I'm really happy to be on here. You know, one thing that particularly struck me from our book and the conversation is the idea that, well... You've heard the expression that we're just spiritual beings having a physical experience. But Kim says it's more like we are a consciousness having a spiritual and a physical experience. Now that struck me because it seems to make more sense. If consciousness is an energy that all comes from the same place and we are bits of that consciousness that only differentiate each other through the experiences we feel in our bodies, and Kim would say in many bodies over many lifetimes, then that unity we all feel sometimes after meditation or through a psychedelic drug, that oneness man, is because consciousness itself is indifferent. It's just the bodies that express itself through are different. The whole namaste thing is even more powerful when you realize that other people are built from the same stuff as you. Their experiences have just led them to where they are, even if they're in opposition to yours. 
It just helps to engender a little empathy when you realize that everyone else is dealing with their own crap too. You know, it kind of reminds me of that Aristotelian idea of the divine spark. That uh, there's, in Gnostics have that too, that there's a little bit of God, of the divine in each and every one of us. And that's the part we try to access when we pray or do something spiritual. It's that idea of the breath of life. Consciousness exists as a universal force that we all come from and we all go back to. There's not just a finite number of souls that exist independently of each other. It's all one thing. It's all the breath of life. And that's the idea behind this week's Sunspot song, Breathe. for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Hi, everyone. This is Wendy. Before I head off to meditate after that inspiring interview Mike did with Kim McCall, I would love to thank all of our Patreon community members. They are the people that make it possible for us to continue producing this podcast and to continue creating new original music and to continually explore bigger and better things that we can share with you here on the podcast. Now, I'd like to send an extra huge thank you to Ned. Dr. Ned is pledging us at a level that he gets this custom shout out every episode, and we truly appreciate your support, Ned, and all of our community members. We had such a good time at our hangout last week. One of our monthly hangouts is a perk that you can get by joining our community, and you can do that by visiting othersidepodcast.com slash donate. Thanks again for listening, and have a wonderful week. Meanwhile, I've got the direct line to God, and uh, I'm going to go talk to him with my third eye. See ya.